Adobe have just updated Photoshop to 2025 and Adobe Camera Raw to version 17. In this video, we're going to be focusing on Camera Raw version 17. We're going to talk about the features that I think are absolutely awesome and the ones that they keep cramming down our throat. Now, the ones that they keep cramming down our throat, I'm not a huge fan of, but I'm along for the ride. Anytime there is a Photoshop update, the first thing that I do is I type in Google helpx.adobe.com what's new in camera raw. That's exactly what I type in. And I usually find within the first hit is Adobe's blog where they talk about all the new things in Adobe camera raw or whatever program might've been updated for this one. We're looking at generative remove powered by Firefly has been updated. We also have generative expand that has been updated. Some obviously supported cameras and lenses and other enhancements. Here's the crazy thing though. Typically where you're going to find the best new things that come out in Adobe camera Raw or Photoshop. In my personal opinion, it's right here where you see, see the detailed new feature summary. We'll talk about the distraction removal. This is one of those things that I think that they keep shoving down our throat. Well, more on that in a second. Again, with this generative expanded AI stuff, we'll talk more on that. But what I really want you to see here is right down here. To me, the two new things that are in Adobe camera Raw that I think are absolutely incredible is this adaptive profile, which is still in the infancy stages. It's still beta. And the idea that you can put your denoise, raw details, or super resolution in a non-destructive manner within the detail panel without having to create a new DNG image. This is one of these things that I have been really hoping Adobe would do after they released this new denoise feature. So now that you know how to find all the Easter egg features when Adobe updates, let's jump into camera roll and we'll dissect these new features. The first one I want to talk about is this new generative expand. I want to get the things that I don't really like out of the way so I can really dive deep into the things that I really enjoy about this new update. If you're wondering where generative expand is going to be, go into the crop tool and you're going to see generative expand here and it's grayed out. Why is that? Well, this is kind of like when you go to crop something and you see those little squares on the outside, you need to see those squares on the outside for this box to open. Otherwise, there's no need for it to generate anything on the outside of your canvas. So with this image in particular, I don't like the fact that I don't have a straight line going from the top down to the bottom. That's my own fault. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the straighten tool and I'm going to straighten right from the top, right on down to the bottom, straighten that out. Okay. So that's nice and straight. Got that straight and couldn't get it straight in camera. Let's say now what happens when I, when I commit to this, well, it's going to stay within the bounds of this image and I can't extend outside of those bounds. But what if there is a feature or something on the outside that I don't want to get cut off? That's typically where I would go into Photoshop and I would do this on my own in Photoshop. However, we now have the generative expand tool here, but we need to get some of those squares on the outside first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this scale down so that we see some of those white and gray squares on the outside. And then I'll press generate. You can see now it's unlocked. Adobe's going to do its best job to find all the details that it can add into those white and gray squared areas. And we'll see if it does a decent job. All right. So now look on these outside areas here, specifically down here by the pews. Let's see what happens as we move the generate here to see what it's going to fill in on those sides. I think generative uh, fill option number two is probably going to be my best and I'll say keep. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use, I'm going to get out of this so we don't see any of the, the previews anywhere. And I'm going to use my magnifying glass and I'm going to zoom in up in these corners. Now, the crazy thing that I don't really care for about this generative expand thing is that it doesn't match the noise and detail profiles yet. While I really enjoy the fact that this is a possibility for us on large files, we just aren't going to have the detail that we need or the no, the noise profile matched to this or the detail profile matched to our original image. So while I think that this has the potential, it's just not there yet for production standards. Let's move on and talk about the new noise reduction feature that allows us to add denoise AI denoise into the raw file without having to use a DNG file. I think this is incredible because in the past, what I was doing was I was creating these very large DNG images just to reduce the noise. And then I would end up deleting the raw file because I'm like, I got to have a lot of these crazy files hanging around that are just huge. Do I really need this raw file if I have this DNG file? So I would keep the DNG and discard the raw. 
Now I'm not doing that. As a workflow purpose, I don't have to do that anymore. But in order for you to be able to use this denoise feature like this, where you see your denoise raw details, super resolution, and, and embed it into the raw file itself, you're gonna wanna go into the settings first. And then in the settings, go to down here to where it says technology previews. And then in technology previews, turn this checkbox on. It should be off by default when you install the new version of Adobe Camera Raw. Now what's gonna say is changes will take effect after restarting the host application. So that's not Adobe Camera Raw. So just don't close out a camera and try to open a new raw file and think that this is gonna work because that's not the case. If you're working with Photoshop, you have to close Photoshop as well reopen Photoshop, and then when you go into Camera Raw the next time, you should have this capability. So now, when I use this denoise feature, the AI denoise feature, I get a pop-up similar to what we would have before, but the great part about this is that now when it's at the raw level like this, if I zoom in, I actually get the slider right here, so I don't have to commit to what I wanted to reduce the noise to like I did before. In the past, you would get a preview, you would commit to it, and that's what you were stuck with. Well, now I get the, because it's already generated the preview within the raw file, all I need to do is move this slider to get the exact noise reduction I want from the AI noise reduction. And I can see firsthand what that's gonna look like as I move this back and forth. This is awesome. This is a feature that I'm so glad they added, especially because I don't have to commit to overly processed noise reduction after doing some of my other noise reduction or even sharpening down here. I can do them in tandem now instead of doing the noise reduction on a new DNG file, then going into this stuff and then saying, oh, did I reduce the noise too much? Well, I don't know. Let me go back to that raw file and let's reduce it at 25 instead of 50 or 75 instead of 100. You see what I'm saying? So now we actually have that capability built right and baked right into the raw file. And I think that is incredible. But make sure you go to your settings and in your settings, toggle that uh, checkbox on, restart your Photoshop and you're good to go. Moving on to another new feature, the generative remove tool. So in the generative remove tool, to get there, you're gonna to go to this little eraser thing right here. We're gonna click on this. Look, it's like, remember that big pink eraser we used to have when we were kids? Yeah, that's what it looks like to me. It's a big pink eraser. And instead we're gonna go, but now we're gonna to go to use generative AI. There's this new detect objects toggle. What makes this great is that now you can just draw a circle around the object that you want to remove and it will detect the object if there is one in there. Right now, it's just seeing a giant box. So if I don't wanna to commit to this, I'm gonna press cancel. I'm gonna draw that a little bit better and just go around like this. That way I don't have to use a big brush. I can just draw around it and you see it, it's gonna do its best to find the object. If it doesn't find the object, it's going to uh, fill in the blanks on where I traced around that object. So once I press remove, we're gonna see how well Adobe Camera Raw replaces that object back there. So I'll zoom in, I'm gonna use my magnifying glass and zoom in, and on this background, we can't tell very much. It looks like it did a pretty good job of matching that noise profile, but if we zoom in really, really close, you see here, it doesn't match the noise profile. And this is one of those things. If it doesn't match the noise and detail profile, I'm kind of like, yeah, you know what? I'm not gonna use this at the raw level. Why? Because now I'm forever committed to this giant splotch right here, not matching the rest of my imagery. To some people, that's okay. To me, it's not. I would much rather use something like not the generative AI tools, but just your regular remove tool that is in here. I'm gonna get off of my magnifying glass here and just use this regular remove tool to remove most of these objects. Because then when I go in, I might have to do it a couple times with these tools because they get a little confused sometimes, but that's okay. That's okay. Let me go ahead and move in here. Why is that okay? Because I would rather use something that is going to match my noise profile while it um, removes that object than something that is not going to match my noise and detail profile when I use that. So for me, this generative remove thing, not the greatest thing in the world. The generative expand thing, okay, it's more of the same. They keep cramming this down our throat though, as if this is the thing that's supposed to be amazing. And while I do think that this artificial intelligence that can remove this stuff is a phenomenal feature that we have not had in the history of you know, photo editing, I think that that is great. Don't get me wrong, but if it's not gonna be production level, I don't want it. And right now it's not production level. It will get there though. I have faith in Adobe, I always have. But let me move into my absolute new favorite feature in Adobe Camera Raw 17. And it's hidden right here in the 
basic settings here, right under profile, we see something called adaptive profile. It's an Adobe adaptive profile. I'm going to press that. Okay. Once we press it, you're like, oh, it just seems like the auto button. It's not the auto button. What's happening here is this adaptive profile is doing a phenomenal job to look at the contrast in the image. For several years, I've been teaching this concept of tone clustering and how the eye sees clusters of tonal value in the image. In my opinion, this Adobe adaptive profile is a very good starting point for wildlife and landscape imagery and maybe some interior architecture stuff. However, this can get very HDR very quickly and it can get really ugly and grotesque. But what you need to know about this is that if you use this adaptive profile, it is going to change the nature of the way all of your sliders work because as I see it, this adaptive profile is trying to work your image to manipulate the tonal clustered data in your photo. I have something in my visionary panel called the tone sculpt, and this is similar to the tone sculpt, but happening at the raw level. It does get a little bit HDR esque, but I think it creates a really good visual appeal again, for wildlife and landscape imagery. I probably wouldn't use it very much on portraits. We'll touch on that, but let's dive in and see what's happening here. So when we move this adaptive profile slider, look at how this image starts to look brilliant just by moving this slider. I get more access to my tonal values through my sliders in the light section without even touching them yet. Once I start to touch them though, watch what happens as I drop the highlights, maybe even expand the shadows a little bit, give ourselves a little bit of contrast, maybe a little bit of a boost in exposure, and maybe I'll drop those whites a little bit so they aren't so strong and make those blacks a little bit darker. This adaptive profile is great for really pushing the tone clusters of how the viewer sees the image. If I change this to Adobe Color though, Look at how the image changes because these sliders are not working on the clustered data of information that is within the image. And that would be your clusters of highlight, your clusters of shadow and your clusters of midtone value. These sliders are only working on what it knows as a highlight. Again, people who've been following me for a while and have been working with me with my tone sculpting actions that I've created and also with the visionary panel, if you're interested in that, you can click on the link below to learn more. You'll learn all about how the viewer sees the image and you'll really understand this tone clustering concept. But at Adobe Color, this doesn't look that great. I'd have to actually push these sliders in different directions to even try to get close to what I'm getting in this adaptive profile here. And again, this was up higher. So once you change to Adobe Color, this is going to change your amount. I feel like this is really good. This is a great starting point for this photograph of this chicken, this ordinary chicken, to jump into Photoshop and make it look extraordinary. And it started with this adaptive profile. So some people are gonna ask, Blake, how does this change your workflow? It doesn't really change my workflow. My workflow is still going to be the same, but I get a better starting point at the raw level to then jump into Photoshop and manipulate my images even more. That's why this feature excites me. I've only had a day or so to work with it at this point, but I'm really looking forward to it. So what you're seeing here are three images from the same bracketed series. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this adaptive profile on here and I'm gonna bring it all the way up just so you can kind of see what's happening here. So that's all the way up. I'm gonna go on this one, this adaptive uh, profile here and move that all the way up and then go to this one use that adaptive profile and move it all the way up. What I feel this adaptive profile is trying to do is give us more dynamic range within our raw file before we even start touching these sliders. If you've never worked with profiles before, it's basically something that's resting right on the top of everything that is happening in your um, raw settings here. So any slider adjustment I make to this image or this image is not going to be the same for this one because the level of darkness in this underexposed shot or the level of brightness in this overexposed shot. So as I move these sliders and adjustments here on, let's say this middle exposure value here, bring those highlights down a little bit, bring those shadows up a little bit, maybe bring that exposure up a little bit. You'll start to see that as I move these sliders, I can't move them the same way on this image because the, this image is very different in the original exposure that I was given. So in order for me to make this file look like this file, these sliders had to move quite a bit differently. Now, the reason why I show you that though, is because I want you to understand that this adaptive profile is working on the top of everything that is happening 
underneath it. And what I mean by that is anything that you do in Adobe Camera Raw, this thing is going to be on the top most um, layer, let's say. So as you manipulate the things underneath that topmost layer, it is going to change how that adaptive profile is working on your image. And that's how profiles in general work. To me, this feels like a LUT based profile, a very smart LUT based profile that I think does a phenomenal job. I'll show you my success with it and I'll show you some failures with it. This is, I think, a very successful use of this adaptive profile here. Look at the before and the after and how it really changes the structure of that waterfall. This is what I'm talking about with tone clustering. What I see here is that this is targeting those clusters of tonal value and it's manipulating them very well. Now, this to me is a success. If I were to change this to Adobe Color, it's not nearly as successful. This Adobe Adaptive Profile that is currently in beta, I think has some serious potential to unlock for us in the future. So as we work with this tool, I feel it's gonna get better and better and better. Where I don't feel like it's successful is on photographs of people. So I go into here and I put in this adaptive profile here and it just blows everything out. And then as I try to minimize those that exposure, I just feel like it's very HDR-esque. And HDR is one of those things that you wanna save women and children from. They should not be HDR'd. Maybe men could be, but this adaptive profile is something I might not use on portraits, specifically portraits like this, maybe environmental portraits where you've got some landscape around them. Maybe that would work out very well. But on typical portraits, on everything that I've experimented with, it makes it have that HDR look. It's not the best idea for an image like this. I would prefer Adobe Color and work with this image specifically with Adobe Color because I don't get that HDR-esque look that I would get with the um, adaptive profile. However, this bracketed series, I don't think it's amazing on these. I really use that only as an example to show you that this adaptive profile, I feel is trying to give us more dynamic range in our raw files. Therefore, it expands that dynamic range for us so we have access to it. And in those files, it almost seems like I didn't really need to bracket too much, especially with that middle exposure value. I probably could get away with just using the adaptive profile and be okay. So that is great news because the likelihood of me doing a lot of bracketed series is probably going to be reduced now that I have a lot of capability with this adaptive profile at the raw level. Of course, you're going to want to make sure that you have a good exposure that you run that through. If it's overexposed or underexposed, you're always going to have issues. But if it's that good, even keel right there in the middle, great exposure, you get it right in camera, that adaptive profile can do some wondrous things for you. Recap and review. Genev Expand still needs work. Denoise feature being added right into your raw file instead of being put into a DNG, phenomenal. Adaptive profile and the possibilities of it after it's out of this beta, phenomenal. I'm really looking forward to what I see in the future with Adobe Camera Raw. And I'll give praise to Adobe for pushing the mold and pushing the envelope with raw processing. I think with the amount of raw processors that are now out there, it's imperative that they continue to push this mold and work to make the raw processor even better. Why? Because it's going to give us a better starting point when we jump into Photoshop to do the rest of the work that we love to do. Thank you for taking the time to watch this. I do sincerely appreciate it. If you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing. I like to take difficult things in Photoshop and make them seemingly simple so you can use them in your workflow today.